thing to email it back to you if you would like that. Um, our next um, uh, life seminar series is October 7th, starting at 3.30, so it's an hour earlier than this one, in the same room as usual. Uh, it will be cardiovascular tissue engineering and a few steps in immune product development by Dr. Keith LaFrance, and uh, he's from Edwards Life Sciences. Uh, second announcement is the next industry committee will be tomorrow at 3 o'clock, room 2216 IDE. And then we'll be discussing the industry breakfast, uh, what topics we want to cover, and we'll also be signing people up for the liaison program. If you would like to be a new liaison, please email one of us again, um, so you'll have at least my email address. Um, and the liaison program is where we'll put you in touch with um, a vice president or CEO of one of our industry partners, and we'll communicate, we'll share information between the company and Georgia Tech, so you'll be a liaison for Georgia Tech to that company. And finally, the G10 Industry Council takes their great pleasure in introducing Mr. Dr. Martin Wasserman, Senior Vice President of Discovery Research and Chief Scientific Officer at Atherogenics Incorporated. Atherogenics is an engineering emerging pharmaceutical company focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of novel drugs for the treatment of chronic inflammatory diseases such as atherosclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and asthma. <coughs> Without further ado, Dr. Wasserman. Thanks, Becca. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yes? I also, first of all, I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon, and I want to thank very much uh, the co-chairs of this uh, meeting and proceedings, uh, Becca and Delphi and Veer, uh, for inviting me to share with you uh, some of the experiences within the pharmaceutical industry and also some of the opportunities and skill sets that would be required or at least sought after uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Before I start, I, I should comment also in whether or not you as essentially bioengineers uh, would have opportunity in the pharmaceutical industry in general. And I quickly looked through my files over the last couple of years. I've been with the company for about three and a half years now, and I've had a summer student program where we bring in two or three students uh, each summer for both chemistry as well as biology uh, in the discovery research arena at Atherogenics. And over the last year, we've had three people from Georgia Tech that have been there, and I'm not even sure if they're in the room right now, and if they are, they probably have heard this presentation before, but uh, Christine Fennessy, uh, Kara Mosley, uh, and Sam Hung. Uh, the first two worked in my chemistry group, the latter worked in my uh, biology group, and they basically spent the June, July, August time frame working with me and gaining experience not only in actually applying what they were learning in the laboratory, but also getting a smattering about what life is all about in the pharmaceutical industry. And as I was telling the co-chairs, it either turned them on to someday consider a career in the industry, or maybe even turned them off, uh, thinking at least I've gotten that exposure and that experience, and I'm not sure that that's going to be for me. But I think it was the former. They were really excited about it. In the past, summer students who had no idea about going back to graduate school or medical school had come to me afterward and asked me to be a reference because now they do want to go back uh, to graduate school or medical school. And we're always delighted when we hear something like that. So keep that in mind also. And usually the requests for summer students will go out, I would say, sometime after the new year, February, March time frame perhaps. And we'll have something posted in your halls here. Uh, and we'll bring some students by. Usually they're sparse numbers. I don't think that we've had more than two to three from any of the local universities that have ever applied for a summer position. But in addition to a, a salaried position for the summer, uh, there's a hell of a lot of experience to be gained. A few months ago, uh, I had the first opportunity of visiting Georgia Tech, and I don't know if some of you in the audience had heard my presentation at that time about the process itself, the drug discovery process in the pharmaceutical industry. If you were here, some of the slides are going to be duplicative. Uh, if you haven't, then you're gonna, you'll see them for the first time, and you'll get an idea about what the process is all about. I've had many 
hierarchical executives in the pharmaceutical industry and scientists, world-class scientists in the industry tell me the science was easy, the medicine was easy. It was understanding this convoluted process of how you get from point A to point B. That was difficult because that was never taught in either a graduate program or a medical curriculum. Uh, the, so the science was okay, but they had to learn that process and exposure never existed to the process. So you'll be exposed to that this afternoon in addition to my sharing with you what some of the important skill sets are and also <coughs> the types of activities that could go on. Now, I did some homework about Georgia Tech. Uh, last week was the Georgia Life Sciences Summit in the Georgia World Congress Center. And I don't know how many of you may have participated in that or attended that, but there was a booth set up for Georgia Tech. And I walked by and I spoke to Ann and she gave me a brochure about what goes on. And I sort of highlighted a couple of things that I saw that it, you don't have to exactly be the specific you know, tissue engineering and uh, device type of uh, expertise to have a possibility of a position within the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, things that jumped out at me were certainly biology and chemistry. If you have expertise or interest in biology or chemistry or biochemistry, that was certainly important. The life sciences in general, just the fact that you understand the process of doing research was important. I saw something that there was a research program in uh, carcinogenicity, cancer technologies, drug delivery, and gene therapy. That's cutting edge stuff in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. And also biomedical imaging, very important, but highly specific, and not every company will have that. Well, some of the things that I'll share with you this afternoon have to do really with both large pharmaceutical companies for which I've spent about 30 years of my career, meaning the real big gun blockbuster companies. I've been at Pfizer. I've been at Aventis, which is now called Sanofi Aventis. I've been at Bristol Myers Squibb, GlaxoSmithKline, these mega people, mega dollar companies with blockbuster compounds. But now I'm here in Georgia and I'm working in Alpharetta in a company that has 100 people. So I'm really getting the smattering of what the difference is between big pharma and small pharma or biotech. It's also, as I was telling the co-chairs, very fortuitous that I'm here this afternoon. For any of you that follow the stock market or follow uh, the company, Atherogenics per se, uh, I'm sure you're very happy, if, especially if you own any stock. Uh, as of Monday afternoon, following the closing of trading, and I'm not here to sell you stock, believe me. <laughs> But as of closing, we had a press release about the results of one of our phase two, or now phase three compounds, for coronary atherosclerosis. And so far, the interim results, we don't have the final results yet, but the interim results show, remarkably, it reverses atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. No other drug does that. No other oral drug does that. Well, the stock went up, and I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, from $22 to $43 within a period of about an hour. <laughs> More realistically now, the stock is, I left at about 4 o'clock this afternoon to come down here. Uh, the stock was about $36 a share. But still, it went up 80% basically overnight from Monday night. So it's fortuitous that we're here because what's interesting is my company has no partner yet. Now, we have no commercial organization business organization. We don't market anything yet. We don't even have a revenue stream yet. I mean, all the money we use uh, is to develop what we hope the future will bring, but we're not selling anything at Atherogenics. But I think all of us who live in Georgia take pride in one of our own companies. This is not New Jersey or Connecticut uh, that, or even the San Francisco biotech arena. This is Georgia, and we have one of our own companies that's actually now making a splash, and I understand it's been on CNBC. There'll be something on CNN tonight, and uh, the company's doing very well. So it is fortuitous that I'm here. Enough of my intro. Let me tell you about some of the opportunities and some of the processes that go on in the pharmaceutical industry uh, that could really just give you a, a, a top-level uh, opinion. Uh, and in my case, it's a biased opinion because I've spent my entire career there uh, about the pharmaceutical industry. 
I was just telling someone a few minutes ago that uh, when I started 34 years ago in the industry, I had finished graduate training at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, and I had gotten my PhD in pharmacology and toxicology. And my chairman and my mentor were positive that I was going to pursue an academic career. I had been courted as a graduate student to bypass any postdoc and join a pharmaceutical company. Now, that doesn't happen anymore. You need a postdoc. But the company was called the Upjohn Company, which was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Upjohn doesn't exist anymore. It's now part of Pfizer, and that's why I said I worked for Pfizer. When I made the announcement or pronouncement that I was going to the pharmaceutical industry, they thought it was a shame, you know, all the black marks against you, and you're, you're prostituting yourself, and there goes your whole academic career, and wrong. Because today's environment, if you can't cut it in the pharmaceutical industry, you can't cut it in academia and vice versa. And we have some of the world's outstanding scientists in the pharmaceutical industry, certainly as well as in academia. But it's not that one is a second tier group to the other. A few years ago, one of my ex-colleagues named uh, James Black, Sir James Black from England, uh, discovered the first antihistamine that wasn't for allergies, but rather was for gastrointestinal acidity, and he called it Tagamet, and it became a blockbuster drug. A few years before that, he discovered the first beta-adrenergic blocking drug called propranolol, or brand name was Indoral, and that became a blockbuster drug. You know, five years ago, he won the Nobel Prize for medicine, and he's from the pharmaceutical industry. So, wonderful careers, wonderful opportunities, uh, contributions, as they say in the nobleness of it, to all mankind can be made not only in academia, but also the industry. Well, here's what it is. It's not uh, magic and eureka and uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that will get you somewhere, but it's actually very structured, as I'll show you in a few moments. Max Samter is someone who's now deceased, but I remember attending a meeting once. My background, my expertise is cardiopulmonary, so I attended a pulmonary meeting, and I remember he, him telling us it's an extraordinary privilege just to be involved in research. I actually had people who, who have worked for me that would tell me things like, I don't even care what kind of salary I get. It's the passion that I have to do the research. And I know there are practicalities about that. You got to pay the bills also, so you got to get paid. But it, they wanted to be involved in the process. It's like, you know, you'll hear athletes who are overpaid anyway, but they'll say, this is what I wanted to do all my life. So the people that you find in the industry are people who are very passionate about what it is that they want to do. And they really want to make a contribution. Many people in the pharmaceutical industry never see the idea they had actually to fruition at the end up on a pharmacist's shelf somewhere. The overwhelming percentage don't. Some people are very lucky to come in in the middle of the program and see it to the fruition. But most people are never seeing it from beginning to end. But just being a part of the process is very rewarding unto itself. Pharmaceutical industry, if I stood here 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, would be a totally different talk from what I'm, I'm presenting to you today. Uh, the world is changing, and it said that if you want to keep pace, you better change along with it. I'll use the pointer here. The mergers, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Hardly a week goes by that somebody is either acquiring somebody else or merging or partnering or collaborating to a significant extent. And what I want to make sure I emphasize here with these mergers, with mergers there are opportunities. Because with mergers what they do is they also find out where they don't need certain skill sets or where they have dead wood and haven't been getting rid of the dead wood in an organization. They now have an opportunity to reduce the force. You'll hear the phrase reduction in force downsizing. But in reality, within six months to a year after that process, all of a sudden there's an expansion and a boom going on in that new company. Now they want to bring in people with various skill sets at the top of their field. I often tell the people who work for me or report to me 
that when they have an open position, don't just fill it with anyone. Fill it as if it's the last position you're getting for the next couple of years. So go out and get the best possible person for that position. But the mergers are taking place regularly, and I'll show you some examples in a minute. The expenditures dramatically increasing. I think I have a number on one of the slides. When I started in the industry, and I gave this talk about 30 years ago, I told them it takes 50 to 100 million dollars to develop the winning drug from beginning to end. Well, it's 900 million dollars now. And two outcomes of that are, number one, it costs an awful lot to develop drugs, and therefore, somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to pay for it. And unfortunately, it's always passed on to the consumer who walks into the drugstore, and if they don't have the insurance, they have to pay an arm and a leg for a prescription. And if they do have the insurance, then it's the insurance company that's complaining. But the realization is it's very expensive. Many industries wouldn't undertake the high risk, but yet high return that you can have in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm not a, a marketing or business person, but if you went into a business class and talked about the model of the pharmaceutical industry without telling them what it is, the business people would say, I'd never invest in that. That's way too risky. And then you're going to ask so much at the end, no one's going to pay for it, don't even bother starting it. Then you tell them it's the pharmaceutical industry. Cycle times, I'll tell you what something about cycle times are. Cycle times are from the beginning of the process to the end of the process, and then an extension beyond that. Many of you know, even in regular business, that you can have new and improved varieties. That's extension, line extensions of something. Or instead of 10 milligrams of a drug, they now get 20 milligrams. Or they combine it with something else, with a decongestant in addition to an antihistamine. Line extensions, cycle times, though, are getting longer and longer. The review process is getting longer and longer, and yet everyone wants to do it in a shorter and shorter time frame. We all know about the generics that are coming up in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. They're cheaper. Now they have to be to standard as well as the branded materials, and that's adding a lot of pressure to the ethical pharmaceutical companies. And then it's no longer develop a compound for it, the U.S., but it's develop a compound for the world. And usually they do global simultaneous submissions of new drug applications. You don't just send it to one place and then six months later to another place for approval. It's usually globally uh, done in nature. Here are some of the different new mindsets and trends that are going on in the pharmaceutical industry to give you a little experience. And NCE, if you hear this uh, acronym, is a new uh, compound or a new chemical entity an NCE, new, something totally novel, totally new. It's not a second generation of this. It's not a me too drug. It's not a follow on drug. It's something totally novel, a new uh, chemical entity. In the last century, that was very rare to have it and very expensive. But as you'll see in this century, they're going to be much more plentiful and less expensive to actually have. But we have to have the best qualified people doing the research to make that happen. The dominance in the past was always the chemist. When I first started out, a chemist would come to me every week and say, Wasserman, here are five new compounds. Find out what they do in the laboratory environment. See if it's any good for anything. And then if it was, then they made analogs of those compounds. Today, it's the genomics, proteomics, uh, systems biology approaches, all the cutting edge omics types of technologies that you hear about. Drug discovery sometimes was serendipity. Serendipity meaning uh, I had a colleague at Aventus who was looking for an antipsychotic drug, and they had a chemical class, and he was testing it in animals. And as part of the routine testing, they also did some testing against the histamine receptor. So he was doing routine testing, and it had some of the properties he wanted, but for an antipsychotic, it had to cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. And I remember him coming one day to a meeting and showing the data that he had on this most remarkable compound, but he couldn't get it into the brain. But he said, likewise, it's the most remarkable antihistamine I've ever seen. This one for allergy type of antihistamine. But all of a sudden, he stopped in mid-sentence. He said, wait a minute. An antihistamine that doesn't get into the brain, that's the perfect non-sedating antihistamine. And that drug was Seldane, 
which the son of Seldane is now Allegra, and it's making about $2 billion a year. Pure serendipity. He wasn't even going after an antihistamine. So that can happen. Uh, it's a very systematic approach now, and I'm going to spell that out for you in a couple of moments. What was very laborious in the past, laborious also meaning uh, boring. I mean, you're cutting edge scientists in, in what you do on an everyday basis. You want to be excited and enthusiastic. You don't want to do the same old boring thing every day, the same old laboratory screen. Now what we find is that it's not going to be laborious. It's going to be uh, revolutionary on an, on an everyday basis. Creative, innovative, these are the words they throw around. Before everything we did was done in-house, in every company, you did it inside. Now you just depend on outside contractors. If you hear the acronym CROs, these are contract research organizations. There are contract clinical organizations. There are site management organizations called SMOs. Everybody's got an acronym. Uh, the clinical development, last century, 10 to 14 years. Uh, in the 60s, it was about eight years. In the 90s, it was about 13 years, and it just keeps going up. What I'd like to see, and we, I'll tell you some examples of how we can do it, we can make it six to nine years. What that does, it extends your patent life, and that's the lifeblood of the pharmaceutical industry. If you don't have a patent, don't bother working in that area. I mean, the first person I would hire if I were starting a company today would be a patent lawyer. And every biotech company, that's usually the first person they hire. Because whatever you have and whatever you discover, you better get it patented before somebody else does. And you go after uh, other activities in clinical development as shown here. Another one is the approval and launch. Before, it was always sequential in one country, then another country, and then a third country. Now it's that global electronic submission I mentioned to you. Uh, organizations today are matrixed. Uh, you may have a senior vice president or an executive something around, but now there's a lot of matrix teams that are involved, and everything is a team concept that you empower people and you empower teams and you get things done much more uh, efficiently. Uh, you integrate things now from discovery all the way to the marketplace for faster decision making, uh, and if necessary, joint ventures or collaborations. Uh, when I say vertical here also, in years past, everybody was siloed in the pharmaceutical industry. The people in, in discovery didn't talk to the people in development, and they didn't talk to anybody in marketing and commercialization. They figured, you know, we know more than you, or you don't understand us. And it was all these different silos within a pharmaceutical company. The last company I was at, Aventis, no longer has an R&D organization. It's a company of 145,000 people but they had no R&D organization by title. By deed, they did. They called it D-I-N-A, Drug Innovation and Approval. And all it meant was you're a member of the same team that a business development person or a marketing person or a regulatory affairs person. You're all one group. And if you discover the drug, you're going to be with that drug all the way to the marketplace. You're not going to just turn it over to somebody else and let them screw it up. You're going to be with it all the whole time. <laughs> Patents, again, are very important in terms of, you know, your strategic weapons. You have to do it. In the past, it was, let's patent this so Party X can't work in that area. That no longer is the case. And information technology, and again, if some of you are interested in things like bioinformatics, knowledge management, in, uh, information gathering, that's a very important role in the pharmaceutical industry. Many companies have a separate, distinct department called competitive biomedical or scientific intelligence just to know what the hell the competition's doing. You could read in the literature. Every time you read a literature article, remember that it's got to be at least a year to two out of date already from where they really are. I remember presenting posters at scientific meetings in areas I no longer was working on a year ago. And people would come up to my poster and start taking all kinds of notes thinking I'm actively pursuing that area. I wasn't even involved in that area anymore. So the best thing to do is you need underground assistance to really understand what's going on company to company. And you have these groups called competitive, scientific, or biomedical intelligence. 
I'm not going to go through these, but I just want to let you see the magnitude of mergers that are taking place in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, certainly starting in even earlier than the 1980s. Uh, the main reason companies merge like crazy is because their pipelines are suffering and they want to get a more valuable pipeline, because they have far too much deadwood, as I said, and it's the reason that they can get rid of people that they want to merge together. It looks good for the shareholders of both groups when that happens. You can get a new direction and a new target for the company, but also you get a new name for the company. So I, I can't keep track of some of the names. When I told you I worked for Aventis, I've been down in Georgia for three years now, and Aventis doesn't exist anymore. It's now called Sanofi Aventis, because they merged with a company, a French company called Sanofi Sintalabo. Aventis had only been in existence for two years because before that it was Herxt Marion Roussel marrying with Rhone Palanc Rohrer. Now, when you go back and look at the legacy companies that made up those companies, there are about 25 different companies. And if I called out some of them, you'd probably say, I remember that company, but those companies don't exist anymore. So mergers are taking place like wild. And here are some more. It's interesting that I show the Herxt Marion Roussel and Rhone Palanc Rohrer. Uh, making Aventus, and Aventus doesn't even exist anymore, so this slide already is out of date, and it's 2003, that's why. This company, Synthalabo and Sanofi had gotten together in 1998. This company now bought Aventus. It's hard to keep track about, you know, you need a scorecard for all of this, but it's, it, again, it provides you, that's the take-home message, there'll be lots of opportunities with any of these new companies that are, are merging, because the first blush is to reduce size. The next one is we made lots of open positions. This is probably the most important slide in the entire presentation. And that is, I just went through and took a look not only in my own organization, but in other pharmaceutical organizations of whatever size. Now again, they could be biotechnology organizations, which are like a boutique. They do one thing and one thing very, very well, but they can't dis develop the drug any further. They're good maybe at discovering a drug or they have a specific technology. Then you have a small pharmaceutical company that could be a complete, reasonably complete company. My company is a small pharma company. Yet, as I told you, we have no marketing people, no commercializing, no salespeople. And when we do have people, it's N equal one. They were asking me about uh, even human resources. I've got one person. Uh, bioinformatics, I've got one person. Uh, toxicologists, I have one person. Say, how do you do toxicology then? We make use of those contract research organizations to do our formal toxicology studies. I'm the head of research. I only have 30 people in research. Very small organizations. But here are the, some of the skill sets, and I want you to take home some of these. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just point out some of the, the classic ones. Because I'm a card-carrying pharmacologist, I put that up front right away. But, uh, f uh, but these, that doesn't diminish from some of the others. You know, medicinal chemistry, I know you have chemical uh, chemistry courses here, analytical chemistry also, biochem is in here. Uh, you can take a look at this list, and I, I see that you have handouts of this, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on that. But I want to point out a couple of things that are, are the really, really hot areas that are coming out. Things like early ADME. ADME, again, is absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. It's really pharmacokinetics, what the body does to a drug. Not what the drug does to a body, that's pharmacology. But pharmacokinetics is what the body does in metabolizing, distributing, and excreting the drug. The word early is, is now revolutionary in the pharmaceutical industry. It was always done when you had the right drug. And right before you put it into humans, you learned about its properties pharmacokinetically. Now they want to know this as soon as the chemist synthesizes the molecule for the first time. You want to know is it orally bioavailable? Can it, I mean, do you get blood levels after you dose it orally in some animal system? Uh, is it rapidly excreted? You want to know that information right up front. What's the half-life of a molecule? So that's important. I have business development on here, uh, patents and intellectual property, even formulations. You know, the things that I put on here that may seem non-scientific, in most pharmaceutical companies, you take a look at the heads of the group and the people that are in the groups, and they got PhD after their name or MS after their name. So they've been in the scientific arena, and they just went into these other areas like data management or medical intelligence again 
or this is a hot buzzword, knowledge management. And knowledge management usually goes for larger organizations. Uh, I mentioned Aventus had 145,000 people located in like six different countries. Well, how the heck does company X communicate with company Y? How do you know who's doing what, who's expert in what, how to tap into some resource and expertise somewhere? You have a group called knowledge management. And everything, everywhere within the company filters into one central location. And then it's their responsibility to distribute that to as many people as possible so they know who's doing what and where that in case you need to contact someone. And that's called knowledge management. Just show you this just to tell you that pharmaceutical companies are spending a hell of a lot of money uh, <coughs> each year. Uh, this is the expenditure in R&D for some of these blockbuster top 10 companies. We're talking billions of dollars that are going back, that are being poured back into research. And that's also, by the way, a concept that many people don't understand and don't follow uh, in the prescription industry, uh, even within the government. They don't follow and understand that. It's not pure profit taking right off the top, but that they invest of their uh, sales, for example, double digit, and some of them high double digit, like here and here, they pour that back into research and development. Companies that started out 10 or 15 years ago as small boutique type companies, uh, some cases have grown up to be very big and highly competitive major blockbuster pharmaceutical companies. And some examples are shown here. Uh, Amgen, I think, now is the number one uh, bio, what was a biotech company. It's not even fair to call that biotech, so we call it biopharma company. Genentech was the, probably the first one. Genentech has like 12 products on the market already. I remember when they were first going after whether or not an antibody could do something to some system. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, and with genes they were playing and ma manipulating genes, and now they got 15 or 20 products on the market, and it's a huge company. Biogen just merged with a company called IDEC in San Diego, and Biogen's in Massachusetts. Uh, Immunex is in the Seattle area, and Chiron. These are now fully integrated, meaning they can do research, they can do development, they can do commercializing, they can do detailing to physicians, regulatory affairs, they have the whole nine yards. Collaborations, not mergers per se, but collaborations. Either the partnerships, fee-for-service agreements, just take a look how this is growing uh, on a regular basis. Uh, more and more getting together. And again, one of the things that they find with partnerships and collaborations is you need more people. You need people who are skilled in the biomedical sciences. And certainly, you're getting that type of very diverse education at this institution. I just want to share with you a couple of things that uh, may, to some of you, sound general. But to others, I think it is uh, maybe the first time that you've seen this. And that is every organization, in my case, the Discovery Research Organization, has to have a mission and strategy. Well, what is your mission? Well, my mission is to rapidly discover breakthrough compounds. My company will not settle for a me too drug, similar or next generation from somebody else's drug. I'm not going after the next Lipitor or Zocor as a lipid lowering drug. We're gonna do something revolutionary because if it's revolutionary, it's gonna drive the stock up 70% and it's gonna be a billion dollar drug also in the end. High risk, but high reward potential. And my company does chronic inflammatory diseases and we use technologies in pharmacology, genomics, bioinformatics, immunology, medicinal chemistry. We use genomics-based efforts to identify the target. That's the, the latest thing, too. How do you identify targets? And I'll show you a slide in a moment where there's almost a humongous number of targets that you can go after. You can get them, get them from the literature, or you can get them uh, from going to scientific meetings, or you can learn from the pathology of a disease, what the target might be, and then follow up on that. The first thing you do is you design assays. Many companies have high throughput screening assays. Again, when I started in the industry, if a, com a company had a library of chemical molecules that had 1,000 or 2,000 molecules, that was big. Now 10 million compounds. 
in a chemical library in a company is not that big anymore. And how do you test 10 million compounds? One of the ways is to design these high throughput screening assay formats. And then lastly, if you're sm we're smart about it and you're doing chronic inflammatory diseases, you could use what is known as a common mechanism approach to be opportunistic and synergistic. And that is, first go after and see if your compound has effects as an anti-inflammatory drug and then start thinking about where the therapeutic indication might be. You may take some of the compounds and go after uh, allergies and asthma. Other compounds, you go after stroke, myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, inflammatory gut disease. There are tons of inflammatory diseases, and they can all spill off of the same platform and the same targets by a common mechanism approach. There was, uh, at, at a, an event this before I left, what they did is they took the same molecule, normally it's done with different molecules, they took the same molecule and did five different clinical trials in five different therapeutic indications. They had the money to do it, and they wanted to see where did the drug behave best, in which inflammatory disease indication. Especially a small company, you better have as your uh, mantra to fail fast. Recognize that a compound is not doing what you want it to do somehow in there and do it early before you spend five million dollars or ten million dollars of that. And then move on. So it is acceptable in the pharmaceutical industry to fail. That's no longer, you know, a slap on the hand and you're doing a poor job. It is acceptable to fail as long as you fail fast. Don't drag it on because it's your child, your baby, you want to move this, well gee, I've got a few more experiments, it's only going to take two more years to do. No, move on. <laughs> Fast proof of concept studies. Everybody knows a proof of principle or proof of concept, and that is it can be done in a cell, in a tissue, in an animal, to see if the target you're looking for is truly blocked, if there's some meaning for it, that you've proven the concept. I want to go after this specific anti-asthma drug, and indeed in an animal model of asthma, it works. That's your proof of concept. Then there's the clinical proof of concept also. You want to make sure it spills <laughs> over and it's representative and predictive of the human situation. Just wanted to show you this, just, uh, and, and you don't memorize these numbers and don't take them to heart. This was just uh, one uh, course, brainstorming course I attended about five years ago where they talked about if you screened one million compounds and decided of those one million, there were 10,000 or so that you actually wanted to synthesize for further testing now, and you identified 25 of them are starting to check out. They look pretty good. Then you select six of them to actually move into the clinic of that million. And of those six, two of them get tested in the phase three clinical trial. This is your blockbuster clinical trial, thousands of patients who are chronic and have that disease you want to treat, you may, if you're lucky, come out with one drug and the process could take 10 to 14 years. This is part of that high risk that we're talking about. We're talking about a million compounds screened and they may not even be the right compounds. But then ideally if you can get it down to six, then down to two, you might get one drug at the end. This is called, in case you hadn't seen it, I want to make sure you're exposed to it, it's called the value chain. Every pharmaceutical company, every biotech company is aware of this. A value chain just means where do you go from left to right in terms of the drug discovery and development process. You target, start, as we said, with the target selection. You know what target you want to go after. You generate the lead compounds. That can take five years. You then optimize that lead compound. By optimizing it, I mean you do the necessary requisite toxicology, pharmacokinetics. Can you scale it up chemically and make enough material that's going to go into clinical trials where there are going to be problems with purification, crystallization, or whatever. You then put it through the clinical trial process six years, phase one, phase two, phase three. And I'm not going to go through all of that. I, I hope that you understand what the clinical uh, phases are, are all about. And then the approval process itself by the FDA could take two years, unless you get one of these fast-track uh, documents from the FDA where they'll 
And I think, to be honest, that the compound I'm working with right now that's in phase three, for which our stock went up, will give, be given fast track, meaning they'll review it in a shorter period of time than two years, mainly because the drug is for heart disease. And there are, it's probably the number one killer in this country and probably the world. And many of the people reviewing the documents at the FDA probably either have it, know someone who has it, or they know they're going to have it. So they'll probably want to review it very carefully and very quickly. Well, this was the whole process that took 10 to 14 years that I told you about. Some companies, when they're trying to be smart, and if they have enough money, instead of doing it sequentially, they do it in an overlapping fashion. Now you're taking a lot of risk again because you're going to start uh, B before A is completed. So there is some risk involved. But here you can start the lead optimization process as soon as you think you have one of the leads generated rather than waiting a little longer. Similarly, the approval process, and, and, and the, uh, this is really the, the product uh, realization starts a little earlier. And then start the approval process very early on. You know what it's going to take to put together a new drug application, the NDA. Start working on it, not at the end of all your clinical trials when you've evaluated all your data, and now you're starting from scratch just to put something together, because that could take six months to a year just to put the entire document together for review at the FDA. Start two years before that. Get all of your preclinical trials written up. Get all of your methodology written up, your chemical synthesis written up. So all you have to do is add on your final clinical trial and then shove it off to the FDA. And hopefully we can reduce that to a six to nine year process. This was more about the uh, common mechanism. I won't go through it now, but it really that you can work on multiple diseases with a common target using common uh, resources. And then in the end, you can come out with four different possible therapeutic areas from the same common mechanism or common target. Here are some advances that have taken place, certainly over my career that I've seen happen, that are going to assist the pharmaceutical industry in making better compounds faster, and they're going to be more effective in the end. The new molecular targets are now mechanism-based, meaning that you understand exactly what happens if you modify that enzyme or protein target within the body. Certainly, you have human receptors. Years ago, everything was in you know, a mouse or a rat. Now you can work with human tissue, human receptors. You clone them. You can clone the enzymes. Ion channels are like chloride channels or uh, potassium channels. You can understand where the, your drug is binding to a particular protein active site and also avoid species differences. I mean, we always keep our fingers crossed. I may have the best drug in the world that works in a guinea pig, cures asthma. Great. What the hell does that mean? I want to cure human asthma. So you, you keep your fingers crossed when you do your clinical trial. But now if I have data that suggests in a human tissue or receptor or enzyme or channel that it works, that may mean an awful lot and give confidence to clinical trials. You can do x-ray crystallography and nuclear magnetic resonance to really understand what the site looks like in a three-dimensional uh, face to it and where does your drug actually lock in where you want it to lock in to modify that protein or peptide. As I told you, the chemical libraries are going up. Every week they're going up higher. High throughput screening. You're getting lots of compounds each week. It's much more than 5,000 by most companies now. If you see SAR, by the way, that acronym stands for Structure Activity Relationship. It means as you modify the chemical structure of a compound, you may be getting greater activity or you may be getting less of an activity. And combinatorial chemistry is an art unto itself. I'm not sure they, how, how far they teach that in, in, in organizations. It's quite practical, whereby you can make many more compounds than you had capability of making in, in the past, and rapidly. Well, this is what the process looks like for any project. I wanted you to just see it in this type of evolutionary uh, diagram. I'm not going to go through it, but again, you get the idea that you start with a very early genomics approach. Gee, I want to do something in the heart, and I wonder if there's some gene I can manipulate or some channel I can manipulate. And then you identify the target and you move through all of these processes till you get to your clinical trials. I haven't even talked about manufacturing. Uh, that's an art, again, unto itself, where you want to make metric tons of material. 
just to make sure you can make it before it's packed into tablets or capsules. And then you file your new drug application with the FDA. Uh, if everything is fine with the FDA, then you launch and market your drug and it becomes personalized medicine. Uh, just one comment about this. The single most important thing that the FDA looks for, the single most important thing is, is your drug safe? That's what they want to know. They're the protectors uh, and watchdog for the people of the world. Is your drug safe? Secondarily, they'll say, does it do anything against any disease? But you may have a wonderful drug that works in one or more diseases, but you know what? It's got possible problems with it. The FDA is going to take a much harder look at the safety issues with compounds, and that's why once in a while you'll read in the newspaper they're withdrawing something from the market. They're not withdrawing things from the market because it doesn't work. They're withdrawing things from the market because some toxicity of some sort has popped up. I won't go through that. Just wanted to show you here, I promised I would show you that if you look at the human genome, and all of you are familiar with the Human Genome Project, they identified 30 or 35,000 different proteins. Interesting, when the Human Genome Project started, they said there were going to be over 100,000 different proteins. Well, when they finished it, they were pretty sure it was only 35,000. And of those 35,000, there are probably 400 known targets, meaning that there are a lot of unknown targets still buried in people who are interested in genomics and functional genomics and really want to go after these other targets. So what does that translate into? Translate into an opportunity an opportunity to go get revolutionary, totally new targets. It's going to be expensive, and the more genes you have, the more and better targets you can get. This is just to show you where the present drug targets are in these pockets. Everybody knows about receptors like the histamine receptor or the adrenergic receptor. Uh, enzymes we know could be good targets. You're looking for an enzyme uh, antagonist or an enzyme inhibitor and other things here. The novel targets that you find, they could be the, dr you could make them the drug themselves. Very expensive again. In other words, if it's missing, it's not functional, maybe you could just administer that target. Novel drug delivery, very important here too. Here are some of them that are listed here. Note that you don't give protein drugs orally. They're going to be digested, so they have to be given by some other route of administration. Most likely by injection but you can also give them by inhalation. There's a, now a new form of insulin that's e uh, inhaled insulin. You can put insulin in the nose. You can huff it through the mouth. Um, it's, it's all different now. Uh, or by injection. You can do patch on some of them, but you just can't give it orally. That's a limitation. Uh, gene therapy. Oh, it's interesting. One of the arguments about our drug in my company that's an oral drug for atherosclerosis, a few months ago they came up with something from a company called Aspirion. It was called ApoA1 Milano, and it raised levels of your good cholesterol levels, HDL, and it reversed cholesterol, or it had that potential to reverse not only cholesterol problems, but it also reversed atherosclerosis. Problem? It was injectable, and you had to continually go back to the physician for injections. Our drug is an oral drug. That's a specific advantage, is the way you're able to deliver a drug for the compliance by the patient population. You can deliver a drug orally. Once a day, you're, you're uh, far ahead of the game right there. If you have to give your drug four times a day, and they've got to you know, put a bottle of medicine in their pocket or pocketbook and carry with them all day, you're hurting. If you've got to put it in a special device, they may be hurting, unless there's nothing else to treat the disease, and then you'll win in the end either way. And here are some other examples of uh, what comes out of genomics that could be useful. And certainly you're familiar with using um, humanized monoclonal antibodies. The latest one to be approved was a compound called Zolaire from uh, Genentech in collaboration with Tanox in collaboration with Novartis. And this is a drug that's a humanized monoclonal antibody against one of the immunoglobulins that's involved in allergy and asthma called IgE. And it takes IgE levels in allergic people and it bottoms them out to zero. And these people are helped. It's also by injection. Here are some of the advantages uh, and advances that have taken place that I'm, I'm pleased to say that I've seen if not been a part of over the last several decades and what we're seeing in the, in the present. I think the ones that uh, are here mainly are that the libraries have increased in numbers you see. 
these are chemical libraries, and also the time it takes to screen targets. Uh, we've reduced it down to weeks here and then very few weeks <coughs> here now. So even in a small company like Atherogenics, I get a new target, I get an assay design, I've got, I'm pleased to say I've got a 40,000 compound library. We can screen that in a couple of weeks. And years ago, that would have been a couple of months. So there are advances that are taking place. I talked about this a little bit. You're, where you value uh, success in pharmaceutical companies, you can say, well, I have a platform. This is what boutiques have. I have a certain design platform about what I'm specialized in and I'm expert in. Then you have the pipeline of drugs. Then you actually have the products that you sell. That's what everybody looks for, especially the potential partners and Wall Street. Wall Street says, nice, better, especially if it's a diversified pipeline. You have some very early things in your pipeline, some mid things that are moving along nicely, and some things right on phase three ready to uh, NDA submit. And with the valuation going up, you have the preclinical proof of concept here we talked about, the clinical proof of concept, and then you do your NDA submission, and now you have value with your products. Just to show you the size of, of the different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, and the expense that goes along with this, I mean, is outrageously expensive. I mean, in one of the phase one or phase two studies, it's more than my annual budget in research, and that's just for one clinical trial. So that's, that's where it's consumed. I would probably say 80 to 90 percent of all monies in the pharmaceutical industry is for these phases of clinical trials and what they cost. It's not unheard of in a one-year clinical trial to spend $20 million. So that's where it all is. And, and research just doesn't gobble up as much money. Even with all the equipment, the technology, the manpower, it's not that expensive. How about failures? I wanted to give you some reasons why uh, drugs fail in the pharmaceutical industry. They fail because somewhere along the line, all of a sudden, we find out there's a toxicity issue. Maybe we find out the drug doesn't work. It doesn't work to our satisfaction, or it doesn't work better than the competition that's out there. And you always have to be mindful of that competition. Maybe all of a sudden the market changed. The market was driving, let's say, for a lipid-lowering drug like a Lipitor. All of a sudden you were working on another lipid-lowering drug, and it takes you five years longer to develop it. And all of a sudden the market said, you know what? We're satisfied with Lipitor and Zocor. We don't need your drug anymore. So sometimes they fail because of what the market where it's moving back and forth, and whether or not it has certain properties like, can you actually formulate it? The pharmacokinetics, the ADME, it also fails sometimes for that. I just wanted to show you this. These are my key values and operating principles that I've put on in every company I've ever belonged to, and they're all common sense types of things, but I just want you to see. Urgency. We, we're here in the pharmaceutical industry, and it sounds banal, but we want to make sick people well. And sick people are counting on us. Also, if they're not counting us, they're going to count on the next company, and we're going to lose that opportunity. So we better do it and do it fast, but do it well. So urgency here, the speed of delivery. We have to be creative and have new ideas and originality. That's very important. Breakthroughs. Everybody talks about breakthroughs and innovation. <clears throat> One take-home message on the word innovation. The only time any idea is innovative is when you get to the market ahead of the competition. I can have a breakthrough idea this afternoon, and we could be working on it tomorrow morning. But unless that's carried through all the way to the marketplace, it's not an innovative idea, because someone else can scoot me down the line, do it twice as fast, they get to the market first, and theirs is called innovative because there's nothing like it anywhere. Make, have the courage, the courage to stop when you have to stop something the courage to tackle a tough problem, uh, always speak the truth. You know, you know, always you know, climb up and bite you somewhere in the future if you don't consistently present the truth in whatever you do. Uh, I, I tell people to challenge scientific ideas. Uh, I want respect between scientists, but challenge the ideas. And I think I have respect down here also. Uh, interrogate concepts, support people, and listen. Be a good listener. Empowerment I spoke of earlier. Everything in the industry now is teamwork. 
You will be, if you choose to go to the pharmaceutical industry, you will be a member of a team, guaranteed, some team. You don't do anything by yourself in the pharmaceutical industry. Research team, development team, program team, project team, everything is a team and have the highest standards of uh, being ethical and honest with what you do. So in conclusion, and the timing is right, I see, just wanted to let you know that it's rocketed skyward these prices, $900 million now, and that's for the winner drug. We haven't talked about all the losers either. That's the winner, it costs $900 million. So only a small percent of the drugs entering clinical trials ever make it to the market anyway. In fact, I did see on one of the chat rooms about my compound uh, right after our press release this week saying, it's only a phase two interim result. The likelihood of that drug ever making it anyway is probably n zilch. Now, I mean, that's a pessimistic way of looking at it, but that's th they're saying it because of this type of number. Drugs entering the clinical trials very rarely make it all the way. The expenditures worldwide are going up remarkably in developing drugs in the pharmaceutical industry. And as you see, since the last 20 years, remarkable uh, increase. The time from discovery, when the light bulb goes off until it's actually been approved, is increasing. And we're trying to decrease it, but it's been increasing. Only 30% of all marketed drugs actually get a positive return on investment. You know, you get, what is it, 17 to 20 years patent life now. And you bust your hump and you finally get your drug on the market and you find out you've got two years patent life left before the generics eat you alive. And in those two years, you may not recoup that $900 million you just spent. And then this is less than 50% of the applications for an NCE are eventually uh, approved. Uh, big Pharma, every year you read about big pharmaceutical companies. We're going to have three NCEs filed for NDAs this year. Good luck. That's their target. Most companies don't reach that target. And then lastly, and specifically applied to each one of you in this room, the mergers and acquisitions that I spoke about, they're increasing opportunities in the pharmaceutical industry in many of the disciplines I shared with you. You have to have a willingness. If you're not versatile, you, know, you can play any infield position or any outfield position uh, and flexible then don't go to the pharmaceutical industry because I list on my resume now that I have expertise in cardiovascular, pulmonary, gastrointestinal, kidney, immunological, inflammation. The only reason I put that on it, that's where I've been switching around throughout my career. You cannot say specifically in what you want to do for your entire career. That's very rare. So you have to be flexible. Today I could be working on chronic inflammatory diseases. Tomorrow we find out our, drug, our company is going to be working on antifungal products, and we need you, Wasserman, to do the following. Well, I have a choice. I'm either flexible or I say, you know, adios, I'm going somewhere else. So you have to be versatile and you have to be flexible. And part of that is continued education. If you're really interested in business development and licensing, I just shared with you earlier, many of these people are PhDs in the biomedical sciences. What do they do? They take a night course here or there, or they go for an MBA somewhere down the line. Many big pharma companies will sponsor you and send you to night, you know, night classes to get your MBA. Many of the patent lawyers I've ever met in my career are all PhDs, and now they're JDs also. They're lawyers, and uh, they went to school at night, or they took a year off to go back to school, uh, so there are lots of opportunities. Uh, Make sure you can obtain what you think the competencies are that companies are looking for. And all of these apply to you and to what they're looking for. And here are some of the newest things that you're going to be hearing more and more about in the future. Uh, genomics, as I mentioned, for target identification, functional genomics, proteomics, knowledge management I men mentioned. You've got to pull all this information together and I can tell you at Aventus, they probably had 40 or 50 people in a knowledge management department. None of them went to school for knowledge management. They just were willing to learn what it takes and what websites to get on, where to source your material from, where to do competitive intelligence, your scientific medical intelligence. You really have to be gifted in computers for this. And then lastly, business development and licensing. It's a fascinating area. I'm sure the people in my company are going to take 
our phase three compound. They're going to be talking to big pharma as we speak. And they're going to try to make, but it's a whole art form of negotiating. I mean, I'm not good at even buying a car and trying to negotiate with the dealer. <coughs> but you've got to know what you have, how valuable you think it is, what the comps are with other types of business deals that are going down, and be able to get together and speak from a business perspective, not from a scientific perspective. But it's an area certainly worth uh, considering and worth pursuing. And then lastly, my old friend Louis once said that in the field of observation, uh, it's interesting that chance favors the prepared mind. Know what you want. Uh, someone asked me earlier, should I just go to the pharmaceutical industry and should it be big pharma, small pharma? And the answer was, Spread out, be diverse, just like your financial portfolio. Um, send out resumes to device companies, send out resumes to academia, resumes to small companies, biotechs, large pharma, and see where you click. And the, only, the last advice I would give you is wherever the opportunity is, if you have the persistence and you have the necessary capital in your back pocket, wait for the ideal position that you want to carve out for yourself. If you don't have that uh, money av availability, then take some position. And while you're working in a new position, either learn that you can take something else within that company. I've had people join me in research after having started in business development or something. So they came in, they really wanted to be in research, and over one or two years, they start learning about the research going on and then applying for open positions. You get the inside track in companies you're usually looked at first before they go outside for candidates. That's number one. Number two, while you're employed in one position in one company, you can be outside looking at other companies at other positions, and now you have a, a bargaining strength behind you because you're employed. And they're going to say, well, I'm going to have to really pay this person well. He's coming from strength of where he already is. He can always turn us down and stay where he is rather than doing it from home with no employment behind. So with that, Delphi, I'll stop, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> questions? Yeah. Be, be, questions yes, and any questions, certainly, before anybody leaves, I'll be glad to uh, try to answer. Yeah. company or every small company, in every contract licensing, uh, my company doesn't do the company, we contract that out, but in every small company, large company, or contract company, there is an animal regulatory committee. They call it either an ALAC, a registered committee, uh, an animal rights committee. Uh, you have to show the protocol without harming the animal, without causing distress or pain to the animal. Uh, you're doing it for the right reasons, not because, oh, I just want to see what happens next. You have to have a specific reason. And it's almost as severe as going to your institutional committee for human clinical trials. But yes, the answer is you have to go to a committee first with a protocol and what you expect to get out of that. And why are you using X number of animals? Should you use X minus 50? I'm sure that the answer is yes. Highly regulated. Unbeknownst to me, over the past few years, every time there's a regulatory in-house team meeting, if this person had an opportunity to finish the laboratory experiment, he would ask how it should end. I don't see what's going on. And I didn't even know about it in that spot. What was the work was getting done in the biology lab? And all of a sudden, a position opens up for a master's degree person or level with industry experience in regulatory affairs. some knowledge, and if you work in one position in the industry, and you keep your eyes and ears open, and you do 
good for a period of time. You might love what you're doing now, but you may want to do something else in the future. I have a number of people in the church that want to go into business development, and I encourage them to talk to our business development people who come sit in on business discussions in different countries, even attend faculty meetings. You don't have to take a course, but there are regulatory affairs meetings on a regular basis, local as well as national, to find out hopefully the school will sponsor these things and make sure that none of that is happening. And some of the groups will say, you know what, that's an investment. It's almost like a deductible to what you went to a professional meeting. So you go and you gain that, you network around, you find out people, and you find out that there are websites. The same thing, there are websites on regulatory affairs. What is expected? What the FDA expects? What is re required of a phase one? A PIMG study? And there's a whole set of guidelines. There are lots of ways of doing it. But one way is if any pharmaceutical company takes an experience in the area of your expertise, and at the same time keeps your eyes and ears open inside the company, and the likelihood of hiring someone first inside the company is pretty, pretty good. Because they'll get to know who you are, they know what your capabilities are, they know you're a hard driver and you know how to get the work done, and you've been keeping up on what they do in that area. Now, if you said, I'm work five years in research, and you have no idea you know, what regulatory affairs is all about, and you have a stellar, and now all of a sudden you want to apply for the position, then they say, you know what, I think you're going to the wrong way. So you're right, unless you know, you've taken formal probing, formal courses, I know the FDA in Washington calls these courses for your mind. Because they have to. And it's only like people in biology say, your mind has to sit on it, you know, take that course in Washington 23 days. Very reasonable. That's the course you take. Career development is supposed to be a focal point of people coming in. So, as of a major responsibility to all executives in the pharmaceutical industry, is to make sure their people are marketable, to make sure they are given exposure to what they really want to do. Because tomorrow morning, if Doreen is telling me I closed out my company, she could be bought out or sold out, and all the people who work for me are now out of a job. That's a very responsibility. They also let you know they're coming in for you, too. And there's no fear of losing a job to saying, I want to get promoted here because I made some good in Suburban Railway and let them know I'm not here for long. No, that's never the case. You should encourage people. I encourage people. You're interested in working in clinical development, regulatory affairs, business. Sure, I'll, I'll do everything I can to see that that happens, either at the same company you're working, or if I know someone else, 